Okay, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that, that introduction. Uh, my name is Bill Lemons. I'm the uh, uh, Systems Engineering Manager for the uh, Civilian and uh, Federal Service Provider uh, areas associated with Fortinet Federal. Um, thank, thank you to ATARC for the opportunity to speak with everyone today with regards to our approach to Zero Trust and to provide a, uh, a short demo of our, uh, our capabilities centered around uh, Zero Trust network access. Um, Hopefully the uh, the information that's necessary is is kind of back end loaded here in the in the presentation, so it'll give a chance for a few more people to show up while I while I kind of set the stage uh, for that information, and then um, um, the, the the more detailed information with regards to zero trust capabilities mapping, how how everything fits and how we integrate, um, you know, will be a a, a part that uh, that kind of centers and, and creates that foundation at the end of the presentation. So with that, um, just wanted to, to, to set some uh, information out there. We've got a number of uh, team members from uh, the Fortinet Federal Organization also participating in the call today. Um, so um, there actually is quite a number of them. So, <laughs> um, you know, without calling them out. In to any questions that may come up uh, as we go through the presentation and uh, speak to those topics. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. OK, so just a quick little outline. Uh, I'm, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to uh, provide just a, a brief overview for of Fortinet, uh, just uh, so that, that people get a level set with regards to uh, what we are and, and how we're focusing on serving the, the, the federal uh, the federal landscape itself. Um, I want to uh, uh, use the backdrop, uh, kind of the foundation of, uh, of, uh, of how we position products with regards to um, the agency's understanding uh, or federal government's un understanding of zero trust, um, you know, kind of highlight the zero trust capabilities mapping that, that we've filled out and, and our approach to filling that out. Um, talk a bit about our uh, overall approach to zero trust as a, uh, as a, as a concept, as a um, uh, as an architecture to build toward over time, uh, and then kind of deep dive uh, a little bit on on ZTNA, our approach to ZTNA, and and, and provide a video of a short demonstration associated with uh, with our zero trust network access solution. So that's a that's a brief overview of uh, kind of the flow of the presentation. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, get it started. Uh, so. For those who don't know, um, you know, Fortinet over 20 years in the industry, uh, so we have been around quite some time. Uh, we uh, uh, we we actually were were born out of resources that left. Uh, if you're familiar with back in the back in the day, uh, NetScreen uh, Corporation that kind of almost started some of the uh, firewall industry, if you will. Um, uh, the, our founders kind of came from that, the genesis of that particular organization, and um, we've been delivering systems in support of cybersecurity ever since. Uh, so, um, you know, over 50 products now in the portfolio. Um, um, the revenue has been moving up to the right uh, quite consistently over um, over the, the past many years, uh, and really one of our big um, uh, our big benefits to the market is is kind of not only addressing things from a software perspective, but also bringing a, a hardware based approach uh, to delivering uh, complete systems in support of cybersecurity. Um, one of the things that that people uh, don't understand is that Fortinet in and of itself is um, it's a global company and um, the two thirds of the uh, the revenue of the company actually comes from outside of the US so it's um, we, we have an incredibly broad base uh, of both deployments worldwide, um, as well as um, a, a network of gathering threat intelligence across that entire landscape as well. So um, the company itself has now eclipsed over 10,000 employees. Um, and, you know, from a, from a sales and support and development perspective, uh, we kind of uh, cover the entire globe with regards to that. Uh, however, Obviously, everyone uh, here is much more interested in how we support federal. Uh, and uh, a number of years ago, the company went and, and decided to create a federal subsidiary uh, to help support that effort. Um, we've been supporting the federal marketplace for, for well over 15 years, uh, but uh, we understood that it required a much more focused effort to be able to meet the needs of the federal agencies. So uh, we decided to uh, create that subsidiary. Originally, the subsidiary 
really focused on the areas of sales and support. Um, but uh, just recently, we've we've taken a renewed effort at, at kind of doubling down on that effort, um, and have really pushed kind of the envelope as far as uh, you know further defining that entity and and creating um, uh, creating a, a full Fortinet Federal Inc. Uh, organization. Uh, kind of from the top down to help support this effort. So um, that, you know, renews our efforts in the areas of, of trying to provide clear personnel, focus on all of the agency certifications and, and ensure we have a secure supply chain to bring in support of the federal space as well. Uh, backing up all of this, um, of course, you know, we wouldn't be able to, to serve the community if we didn't have a robust training environment. So we have the, um, the NSC training program available uh, for consumption, both in a, uh, a self-service mode, as well as a, um, you know, online construct, uh, instructor ed uh, led or, um, you know, in-person class, uh, classroom approach as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a very well uh, very well-rounded program uh, and also one that's supported across industry in general. Um, so that, that self-paced learning capability is actually free to the public. So um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a unique opportunity in the space uh, to gain some knowledge with respect to both cybersecurity as well as our approach and products in that space. Um, so encourage everyone to kind of take a look at that. Uh, again, with that idea of kind of setting the stage, a lot of this material is going to be available um, for more detailed inspection and review on the huddle site following the, the, the meeting. So I'm going to very quickly move through these slides. Uh, so uh, um, you know, uh, please accept the, the brevity associated with this. But I did want to help with, uh, again, kind of that understanding of, of how we're approaching the space, how we're approaching zero trust, uh, and how we're trying to hit the landscape with regards to uh, the, the federal um, the federal areas associated with that. So really, um, you know, some of the things that, that kind of have set the stage for where we are and where we're going with regards to our approach to cybersecurity, um, it, it kind of falls into four major camps, the digital acceleration, um, you know, everyone moving to um, um, uh, electronic resources, remote access, um, uh, cloud-based um, you know, the migration of, of uh, applications from, from cloud uh, or from on-premise to, to cloud-based uh, environments. And then also just, um, you know, equally that transition of our own resources to, um, to, to take on um, and, and bring in new technologies, but also uh, the, uh, the threat actors also leveraging a lot of that technology in trying to um, um, extract additional information and um, disrupt uh, those areas of concern as well. So um, that that digital acceleration, the, um, the the drivers that have led toward work from anywhere, that application journey, as I just spoke about, to um, to, to more of a hybrid and cloud based approach, as well as that evolving threat landscape. Those are really the trends that help drive um, where we go and and how we try and approach the space. Um, don't really want to to spend a lot of time, like I said, in, in all of these particular areas, but I'll, I'll hit a couple of key note things. So, so one of the things is the network edges, right? Uh, so back in the day, it was it was very much a like a castle and moat approach, um, and that largely, you know, it's been implemented many times um, and has certain success if all of the assets are located in a single place. But um, but but really, as as networks get become more hybrid as the mission expands, uh, as that footprint expands, um, that, that doesn't necessarily meet. So we're seeing more and more um, additional edges come to the network. So it's how do you, how do you address security and, and, and provide policy control at those edges as they continue to increase in number and also uh, change in form factor as well. Obviously, work from anywhere um, over the past three or four years has just exploded, um, and it's it's shown some success in still being able to provide effective services. So, with that that big bump in increase that was kind of uh, imposed upon us by uh, just the circumstances that have happened over the past few years, um, that um, we we realize come to realize that that is really not going away. So, uh, obviously, we need to make sure that that any solution that we put forward really addresses those types of things um, uh, as as we continue to move forward. So, can't can't uh, uh, 
can't diminish the, the need for supporting that work from anywhere as part of any solution today. That threat landscape, like I said, just as much as we're trying to improve the overall approach uh, and use of technology to support information gathering, threat intelligence, um, uh, isolation, and the ability to remediate threats, um, they're using the same technologies, if not even more, uh, to try and um, uh, issue and, and move forward with those attacks uh, against uh, our environments. So, um, you know, that, that constant pressure on the other side uh, makes it more imperative that we continue to be on top and continue to modernize our environments uh, to meet these ongoing needs. And then, of course, the application journey. Um, uh, it has been, um, you know, from mandate after mandate after mandate, uh, uh, this, this constant push to move things to um, a, a resource uh, or, or a platform that provides uh, more pervasive access, uh, as well as more scalable architecture, uh, in order to meet the growing needs of the missions. Uh, so that includes uh, not only expanding capabilities and in, in, in private data centers and, and the resources that are available there, but also uh, incorporating the, the use of cloud-based technologies as well to help complement that. Um, I think we've seen an enormous amount of success and, and progress in moving toward uh, cloud-based architectures, uh, but there's also a certain sense of um, uh, the, the fact that that hybrid multi-cloud environment is, is also something that, that can't be dismissed as well. Um, that, that hybrid approach, and I think we'll see that pendulum move back and forth over time, that, uh, that, that those compute and application resources are continue, will continue to flow back and forth based on the, on the needs of both uh, the user community, the uh, support community, as well as, uh, as, as well as the assets themselves that those applications provide access to. So combine all of those things together and then also kind of lump in the fact that operational uh, technology and the connectivity to those control systems are kind of coming into the, uh, into the realm. It kind of sets the stage for where we're trying to go with regards to uh, a more modern approach to um, the, the security landscape and, and, and really starting to, to hone in on the, on the premises of zero trust. So as a company, those are kind of the things that we consider uh, the drivers and, and why we're building out our story with regards to how to approach this. Um, we've been doing this for quite some time, uh, both understanding both the threat landscape and this convergence of what we see as the network and security. Security was always thought of as being some type of overlay you'd put on top of the network that you build today. And, and it, always, it always seemed to be this cost that was going to be uh, placed on top of how do I deliver the applications and, and the uh, access to data that exists today? Um, that obviously can't be the case. Um, uh, security needs to be first and foremost as you build out uh, uh, an infrastructure. So we've always considered the fact that, that there has to be this convergence of security and network, hence our focus on what we call security-driven networking. Um, and then lastly is the, is the need for point products. Uh, point products, uh, to address specific areas of cybersecurity, as well as um, just the, uh, the prevalence of vendors in the space and their ability to deliver in each one of those functional niche areas. Um, so uh, everyone here, I think, is very familiar with the fact that no one vendor addresses every single need across the cybersecurity landscape. So the need for uh, integration, the need for threat intelligence sharing, the need for automation across those uh, those boundaries uh, definitely need to exist. And, and that, and the goal, I think the goal of zero trust, the goal of uh, cybersecurity in general should be the establishment of this platform uh, to support the uh, delivery of intent and policy uh, across that entire landscape. Um, and, and so again, a major driver of, of what we're trying to do. And it's also something that, uh, that, that Gartner recently recognized as a, as a concept uh, as they they pulled forth this this concept called the cybersecurity mesh architecture, uh, it's something that we've been striving for for many many years. Uh, we have a different name for it, but it's it's essentially the same approach. Um, but it uh, it's nice to see that that an industry um, uh, advocate and kind of kind of leader for the definition and and and, and vetting of of technology and uh, and where technology is going to kind of recognize that concept, the cybersecurity mesh architecture. The threat landscape continues to evolve. Um, I, I think I've mentioned a lot of these things 
Uh, this is this is a little bit more generic from a you know commercial and, and global perspective, but again, a lot of the things resonate in the federal space as well. Um, and again, the uh, those drivers are are um, are also contributing to the focus on zero trust as well. So with that convergence of um, uh, networking and security, you know, one of our one of our pivotal uh, elements that we bring to the table is our uh, Fortinet operating system uh, or Forta OS. Um, and this concept of providing Forta OS everywhere uh, is one that, that helps bring this, this very large platform of controls and capabilities. I'll, I'll be referencing it as a, as a policy enforcement point uh, through a large portion of the next part of the presentation. Uh, that that operating system helps facilitate that. And it's um, it's something that facilitates that in many different form factors and in many different ways. Um, so I spoke about one of our major strengths, which is the ability to not only uh, develop software-based solutions, but also leverage a hardware approach platform to deliver that performance and scale. So you'll see the at the bottom of the screen, we, we have an appliance that provides that, uh, that focus and capability um, and it's very easy to see how that can fit at the edge uh, or a place where there are physical divisions between um, uh, resources within a network infrastructure. Um, however, we've taken that same technology and that same capability uh, and have made it available in a virtual form factor, uh, in a container form factor, and then also are, um, are able to offer that as a, um, an as a service uh, capability as well. Um, Throughout that entire landscape of resources, though, we've tried to be cognizant of the fact that we need to provide a, a common and universal set of capabilities across that entire landscape. And we need to make sure that when it's when it comes to managing those resources, you don't have to use a lot of different tools in order to be able to do that. So making sure that the same, the same threat intelligence can feed all of those resources and the same management platform can interact and, 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 and provide uh, policy control over that is very important to that as well. So um, that'll be also another recurring theme that I that I uh, speak to as as we continue to move forward. This is just an additional depiction of uh, of that that idea. You know, kind of where are all the categories of point products that need to exist within an infrastructure somewhere uh, in order to provide the kind of security and visibility that we need to to address cybersecurity as a whole. Um, and the fact that in the past, really the only way for all of that information to kind of come together was to deliver it all to a uh, single platform that could then provide that visibility and then allow either systems or individuals to interact with that data in order to both identify, remediate, and um, uh, deal with those threats as they're found. Um, obviously, that that platform approach takes a little bit more of a um, while while it doesn't replace the uh, value of a sim or, or some other resource that can gather that information and provide some analysis. It doesn't rely on it solely. Uh, it allows for a more direct or a, a more uh, any to any type communication model for the exchange of that information. So uh, we believe that that particular approach, that mesh approach or, or fabric approach is one that, that can truly uh, meet the needs and scale uh, and response time necessary to deal with the current landscape. So um, all of that kind of sets the stage for the platform approach that we've been taking on for many years, and that is in providing what we call this, the Fortinet security fabric. So it's taking uh, taking a look across that very broad landscape of capabilities that are necessary to meet the needs today, uh, making sure that all of those discrete capabilities um, are delivered in an integrated fashion so that, um, again, that threat intelligence can be shared, that a uh, that a, that a pathway or, or an ability to provide automated response exists uh, so that um, uh, while not only can uh, SOC analysts and, and other uh, security specialists provide input as to how remediation and, and, and things need to be addressed within that environment, it also provides the ability to leverage intelligence and uh, machine learning and, and, and AI to help with the automation of that process as well. 
this is a uh, this is a, a kind of high level de depiction of of all of the different areas that we focus on uh, as a product vendor. So uh, across the landscape, whether it's it's dealing with capabilities that sit within the physical networks themselves, whether those products um, come from the perspective of the users and the devices that those users leverage to do their daily work. Um, if that's uh, endpoint protection systems, that's the ability to um, understand device posture and, and, and grant access on, um, you know, wired and wireless infrastructure, um, you know, those types of things, um, whether it's application centric products that, that fall into the area of taking a look at uh, either web based application or mail based applications, uh, or looking at code itself and trying to determine whether malware exists within that environment. Um, and then also all of the complementary uh, components, whether it be taking the data from those uh, devices and doing analysis associated with those uh, and providing some visibility and feedback with regards to that, uh, or providing the tools that operators need to uh, both do their research and then also remediate threats as they appear in the environment. So the portfolio is incredibly broad. I talked about that earlier. Uh, 50 plus in that in that particular portfolio. Uh, but again, the whole idea is that it's a platform approach. Take those individual components, bring them together to meet the needs of the agency, uh, and then allow those integrations to share the threat intelligence uh, and the remediation functions across that landscape. With all of that being said, um, you know, obviously this part of the presentation, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit from the ATARC script uh, here as well. So, um, so for, for one, it's a, it's a great thing to see an agency like or an organization like ATARC bring agencies and vendors together to both showcase what capabilities are in association with the needs of the agency. Uh, but it's also, um, you know, how do we look at, at the idea of, of this best of breed approach to building networks uh, and how do we highlight um, and showcase some of those integrations as well. Um, we, we understand that, that every vendor has their strengths and weaknesses um, and that as a, as a consumer of the technologies in all of those areas, everyone needs to be cognizant of, you know, how do I get the best resources in support of the mission um, and the controls that I need to deliver the right policy? It's not a, it's not a, a one, um, one product maps to everyone's use. So uh, we, we completely understand that. And while we speak a lot about how we build out that fabric using the products that are in our portfolio, we understand completely that that integration with the larger ecosystem, an ecosystem of partners um, that, that span the entire landscape, including many of our major competitors, um, it needs to exist. So we've created this open ecosystem um, and have focused at, at um, laser focus on delivering uh, open um, open access to our platforms via APIs and DevOps connectors um, so that we can provide a high degree of integration with not only our own, the products across our own portfolio, but also the major products um, across the, uh, the, the major players in the industry today. We currently have over 280 um, uh, partners in that ecosystem, that, that ecosystem continues to grow on a daily basis. Uh, so I don't have a full depiction of, of all of the vendors that are in that space, uh, but we'll be providing additional information in the huddle site uh, that include the listing, the current listing uh, of all of those, as well as the link to our partner page so that you can, you can kind of dive in and get some additional information with regards to that. So today's presentation is, is kind of in line with with I believe what ATARC is, is kind of talked about as phase one or taking a look at how we individually approach zero trust. We are also very um, uh, interested and eager to participate in phase two, where we're looking at a more integrated approach, um, putting multiple vendors together, taking a look at the, the capabilities mapping and finding, finding the gaps and where the overlay creates a better, uh, a better approach or a more uh, a higher degree of coverage model for that uh, for those zero trust capabilities and the needs in that space uh, and how they align to your business um, and, and putting those solutions together. So we look forward to uh, kind of extending this fabric approach uh, and how we provide those integrations with those vendors uh, as we as we move into uh, phase two of the, the ATARC initiative here with zero trust. Um, so just wanted to call out this open ecosystem as something that we absolutely are going to leverage 
as we move forward in that particular realm. Um, and we will be able to um, uh, highlight and bring about some uh, enhanced zero trust capabilities by leveraging those, um, uh, those partnerships. Real briefly, uh, we bring hardware to, to bear when it comes to putting appliances in an environment. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. This is something that that if 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 somebody knows something about Fortinet, usually they know that that our hardware um, you know kind of delivers on the on the idea of of performance and scale. Um, this is just kind of a, a quick reiteration of that. If you want to look at it in detail uh, as a follow on to um, uh, uh, to the meeting, or if you if you need to to speak with us in detail with regards to uh, some requirements and capabilities, please feel free to do so. But you know, we we have been both a, a software and hardware vendor for quite some time, um, and you can see here that the ASICs that we develop and deliver in our platforms, you know, are they're multi generational. Uh, you can see that our the the processors that we leverage, system on a chip uh, component, <coughs> excuse me, for our desktop platforms. You know, we're on the, the the version four of that platform at this point in time. Uh, for content and network processing, you can see that's uh, uh, NP7 and CP9. So again, multiple generations of learning and improving uh, in how to deliver uh, the controls capability uh, for those enforcement points. Um, this this is this is uh, this is not just new technology. This is uh, mature and um, and highly proven technology in the space. Something that's not really well known um, is that if you look about look at the number of firewalls deployed across the world, across the globe, um, we're we're over a third of the firewall shipments across um, across the landscape, um, and that number continues to go up and to the right. Um, so uh, while in the you know the U.S. market, there's a little bit more of parity across the the space uh, across the globe, and this just speaks to you know kind of the the diversity that we have in the in the portfolio and and our support across the, the the landscape as well as the threat intelligence that we're able to gain as well with regards to those deployments um pretty well positioned um in, in with respect to our competitors in space um and then another another quick note again on background um and we should be getting close to the end of all the background um is this uh, you know everyone looks to uh, other organizations to to, to, to start to do their investigations and to justify that looking at a particular vendor is an appropriate thing to do. So um, one of the things that a lot of people look to are, are the Gartner Magic Quadrants. Um, and um, you know, we've been a leader, leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrants for quite some time, uh, especially in the network firewall space. Uh, been in that leader quadrant for, for um, approaching, I guess, around 12 years now. Um, but as you look across how network modernization has uh, improved over time, um, there's a number of others that have come into that space as well. So um, the uh, WAN edge infrastructure space, um, that assessment area, that's that's normally um, considered the SD WAN um, a leader quadrant, and then the other is uh, wired and wireless uh, access infrastructure. Um, those are those are all very relevant to everyone's initiatives with regards to network modernization. Um, as you can see, we are uh, in the leader quadrant for network firewall, WAN edge infrastructure. Um, we're also just, just on the uh, cusp of, of moving into that um, uh, leader's quadrant, but definitely uh, considered a visionary in that particular space for wired and wireless. Um, the core across all three of those space is the fact that that's the Forta OS operating system delivering those capabilities. The other key piece is that it's the same appliance that delivers firewall functionality, SD-WAN functionality, and acts as the controller for wired and wireless infrastructure. Um, so that is a that's a very interesting thing to bring to bear, um, and and one thing we like to talk about when we when we're um, when we're being considered for um, uh, providing a component of um, uh, a network modernization plan. I talked about our uh, scope um, of deployments, uh, that information gathering that we're getting from across the globe. Um, we have our own 20-year-old um, 
lab organization that's been completely laser focused on gathering threat intelligence across the space. Uh, and that is where we get our subscription feeds uh, with regards to uh, how to essentially power all of the security controls that we have in place across our product portfolio. Um, so it's incredibly robust. Um, again, it's gaining visibility through not only those uh, that, you know, that, that global network of deployed devices, but also through collaborations um, and, and providing some leadership with, with uh, other agencies across the globe as well. Um, so it's an incredibly well-rounded, well-respected resource uh, across the space. This is just a brief mapping of how that information and, and the categories of that information feed the various devices across our portfolio. Uh, but again, virtually every platform that we have takes advantage of some level of that threat intelligence in order to, to power its security controls across that entire fabric approach. And then lastly, um, a world-class technical support organization, one that we're actually augmenting by uh, now, now moving from a, um, a, a designated group of resources that support the federal government to a dedicated set of resources that support the federal government. That's another advantage um, and, and piece that we're improving upon with regards to the improvements in the Fortinet federal organization. So um, look to see an, an even more focused customer experience um, uh, and, and, and federally focused uh, effort with regards to that over time. I'm just going to throw these slides up there so you see the names real quick, but it, you know we're we're not shy about um, showcasing the fact that that from an analyst recognition perspective, we've got um, you know the areas that you look to that you're you're going to see that they they recognize our our capabilities and platforms across the space. Um, and you know that that doesn't go without um, you know making sure that we we take a, a very proactive approach at making sure we meet the needs of you know FIPS validation and, and TAA compliant supply chain, uh, dealing with the APLs that we need to do to, to support the federal agencies, um, and and also you know looking at other third party certifications and uh, things of that nature as well. So um, definitely we are we're focusing in the right areas to help support our space as well. So kind of wrapping up all of that, um, you know, we're absolutely a global market leader in that space, um, definitely committed to the federal space as well with regards to that. Um, because of that success across the globe, as far as the stability of the company, obviously, we're, we're, we're an incredibly financially stable company and profitable company. Um, so uh, your, your investment is protected in the future as well. Um, and, you know, even though we're headquartered in California, we've got the federal subsidiary um, headquartered here in Reston, Virginia, uh, to provide personal service to our uh, U.S. federal customers. So with that as the backdrop, let's jump into uh, the capabilities model. So uh, again, I wanted to, to give everybody kind of this outline really quickly. And obviously, everyone has seen this. It's, it's kind of, uh, again, one of the core elements that that, that everyone needs to be familiar with and, and has kind of been um, uh, permeated and explained as part of this uh, vendor and agency uh, interaction through ATARC. Um, here is our uh, uh, assessment of our product portfolio against all of those controls. Um, so you'll see that, that there is an incredibly broad uh, set of capabilities that we can provide across that particular landscape. Um, and it's because of that that and and the fact that those products, the the the, the components of those products, you know, kind of span a, a, a large part of the port portfolio. Um, we we really like the idea of having a a direct conversation with an organization about what their needs are and how our particular components can help augment and fit that environment. I think one of the approaches that we've we've always taken, and, and there's there's been a recurring theme in, in kind of chats with regards to zero trust concepts in the past, is that um, uh, zero trust is a journey. It's not just an individual product. There's a lot of a lot of organizations that that sell products that have zero trust in the name, but when it comes down to it, uh, it's a it is a a continually evolving approach to how to build out an infrastructure that can continually approve and continually monitor um, the situa situational awareness of users trying to access data. 
And uh, with that being the tenant and the, and the driving force, I, I don't necessarily know that there is a singular Nirvana solution that can meet all of those uh, requirements for every single use case. Um, the important thing is to put a platform in place that is highly capable, highly customizable, highly programmable to help support those ever-changing needs. Um, so in that vein, we've, we've filled out this capabilities model to help support how those controls relate to the various products that we have. And we can absolutely talk to how, um, if a particular agency has gaps in particular areas, how we can address those gaps with um, the point products that address those particular areas. So for additional details with regards to the individual products that map uh, to these, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to the Fortinet Federal uh, uh, teammates, um, as, as well as just reach out to our federal organization so that you can have a more personal conversation with regards to those. Um, the, um, the PDF that I'm going to be placing on the Huddle site not only has this guide, but also has the legend with regards to the, the numbering scheme and some of the backup information with regards to this. So it is going to be more comprehensive on that Huddle site. And I'll make sure that that's there and available for everyone uh, that participated on the call um, uh, as a follow-up to, uh, to this presentation. Using that as kind of the backdrop. So we've, we've taken uh, all of that information where our capabilities lie, and we want to um, kind of associate that with the, uh, the platform or the, the notional architecture, if you will, of zero trust. So everyone, um, I mean, because virtually every document that's ever been written is kind of kind of relates back to the zero trust architecture as defined by NIST 800-207. So this is just a, a visual depiction of that notional architecture. And this notional architecture is more of just the, if you consider the, the process, this is not a, this is not meant to be a, a network diagram or an assertion of how a network should be built. But it's it's just a, a functional representation of if I am a if I am a user and I'm leveraging uh, a resource to try and access data, what are all of the components that should be considered uh, and provide either input policy and or control on that transaction? How should they how, how should they kind of be both defined and how they should how they should kind of interact with each other? So what I've done is, um, oh, actually what our team has done, I don't wanna just take the credit for it, um, is the fact that we've mapped that entire portfolio of products to this particular space. Obviously, we're not the only vendor that can fit into each one of these buckets. But again, phase one, what we're trying to do is show the completeness of our solution and where we can potentially provide that capability as well. So with that in mind, you take that same notional architecture and you start to plug in the components associated with that space. Um, we believe that one of the foundational components of that is the FortiGate. The FortiGate itself has been a proven policy enforcement point in the industry, in the federal landscape for quite a number of years. Um, it's, been, it's been leveraging the federal organizations well over 15 years. Um, it's, it's been a part of many uh, service provider uh, security service offerings supporting the federal space, as well as an element of custom solutions providing security controls across those spaces as well. So the idea here is that instead of trying to say, how do I take a new product and deliver zero trust, we're trying to say, if you take a look at the products you have deployed today, this is how you can leverage the capability of those products to approach a zero trust architecture and continue to further that zero trust architecture. So again, we're, we're trying to be uh, you know, thought, thoughtful from both, um, from both a, a potential change to an environment or need to change to an environment, um, as well as to the pocketbooks of our federal agencies as well uh, by making sure that 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 we can 
modernize the infrastructure without the need for uh, full up replacement of resources across that infrastructure as well. So FortiGate is the policy enforcement point. It exists in many networks today. It's something that can be leveraged and is a pivotal part of not only the overall architecture itself, but can be, and we'll, we'll show that in the demonstration here at the end of the, the presentation, can be a pivotal component in providing that zero trust network access component as well. And literally, it's just a software update to get to that capability. Um, surrounding the zero trust network access, or I'm sorry, the zero trust environment, um, there are capabilities that exist, um, whether it be taking a look at the, um, the, the system that a subject is going to use to, to access the network. We, we take that first step away from the policy enforcement point. Um, we have a product called the Forta Client Endpoint Solution. That particular platform has been historically our VPN client um, in use in, in, in many organizations, both commercial and federal. Um, and, it, and it provides the traditional VPN approach uh, to um, remote network access. However, um, in the 7.0 release, as we'll, as we'll talk about in just a little bit, that particular platform has now been improved to now uh, use a more zero trust focused approach to how to allow and broker access from uh, a subject requesting access to uh, the data behind a particular application um, uh, and, and make that a more, um, a, a more constrained and more secured operation. So I'll, again, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Another aspect of that is again, how do you how do you then push policy and push um, uh, enforcement remediation capabilities into the environment? And that's normally done through some type of policy engine or policy administrator. So we definitely have capabilities in that space, capabilities that not only manage the resources that are under Fortinet's purview, but also can receive information from other sources of data to help with the delivery of that enforcement capability uh, to that enforcement point as well. So that's what all the other arrows are coming in from outside. And while we can fill a lot of those areas of input with solutions that we have available today. Uh, so for instance, in the case of identity and access management, as well as uh, authentication, you know, we have um, the Forta Client EMS platform, our Forta NAC platform, and we have Forta Authenticator available. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't either complement or replace those functions with the other third-party vendor platforms using that, that fabric ecosystem that we have um, to meet the needs of that input as well. So I don't want to point or, you know, paint the picture that the only way to build out this architecture is with a Fortinet product in every corner of the network. Um, I just want to call out the fact that we can, to a certain extent, if you need us to, um, but we definitely want to work with um, every individual agency or the agencies that are interested and willing to, uh, in order to, um, to truly customize that, that environment to meet their needs and meet their gaps uh, on a growing basis. So with that being the backdrop, let's go ahead and dive into uh, ZTNA. So ZTNA is the, um, if you think about the, the journey of, of modernization and how to approach zero trust, obviously one of the most critical components of, um, of, of trying to get a handle on, um, on, on how to build out a comprehensive zero trust uh, architecture is, is to focus on identity. Having having um, an identity source that's that's singular and, and complete and provides the most flexibility and, and visibility with regards to the environment. Uh, you know, you look across the aspects of uh, legacy resources, ac um, 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 applications within the data center versus um, you know as a service applications in the cloud. Um, that's been a challenge for, for agencies up to this point. So, you know, being able to consolidate and bring those together into one common uh, environment to help, you know, simplify the, the, the control aspects of that, you know, that's, that's obviously a, a, a big piece of, of how to get to uh, more of a, a, a true zero trust architecture. Um, and again, what we're doing is, is trying to paint the picture of how we move along this journey towards zero trust. So just zero trust network access um, 
uh, provides an option for how to migrate away from this kind of very generic user-centered uh, network level access to an infrastructure and focuses much more on that zero trust model that, that I just showed you. The one where we're looking at the user, we're looking at the user system, and we're trying to put the appropriate controls between that request for application access and the application itself. So I talked about the trends. I'm going to skip the enterprise trends that kind of push us in this direction because we've 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 been a I'm sorry about being exhaustive about <laughs> how we've got to this point. But anyway, we've definitely gotten there. Um, we also understand this architectural change as well. So instead of everything being kind of layered on top of each other, it's any to any connectivity. We understand that. So looking at zero trust architecture, zero trust initiatives and how to move us into that particular space. You know, there's been a number of recommendations. Uh, across the industry that zero trust network access is definitely a method to start to move in the direction of a true zero trust architecture. Um, so whether that's provided through a secure access uh, service edge function or whether it's part of a, a, another group of tools to help support that, the, the concept in and of itself is, is one that can bring about um, a, a move toward uh, a, a much more comprehensive architecture uh, aligned with zero trust principles. So um, our particular solution is built upon the foundation of three major components. So we'll start to talk about that. Again, what we want to do is create at a high level something that's very simple. We want to create some type of, uh, and again, on the backdrop of that uh, NIST 800-207 diagram, you know, take a look at the user community, take a look at your application community or where the data resides, and you want to be able to employ a policy um, intent from one perspective into some universal um, resource that helps provide that level of enforcement over those individual users' requests for individual access to those resources. So at a high level, it's a pretty simple concept. Um, some of the you know, some of the additional goals associated with you know why why is it is it being driven you know obviously you know need to have access from branch office campus office while you're traveling um, you need to be cognizant of where the users are and um, and then also take advantage of many modern uh, techniques for how to leverage um, uh, identity and and uh, uh, author authorization capabilities in the space as well um, but but really. You know, how do we go away from this network level access to something that is much more focused on the application itself? So uh, again, it's it's as we move towards zero trust, we're trying to reduce the attack surface and and constrain the um, the access that is grip given to as as small a component as possible. So um, instead of focusing on a user's access to a network. Why don't we take a step further and go to a user's ability to access, gain access to an individual application on a per session basis? Let's go ahead and make sure that that connection on a per session basis also meets some of the strong authentication and single sign on uh, functions that are necessary um, or just, just highly leveraged in today's uh, infrastructure environment. We want to make sure that that device identity is verified on a per session basis and that the posture of the resources and the activity of that user um, is assessed in real time. And it's something that is not just singularly assessed, it's something that's continually assessed. Um, because we're looking at a per session or sir, per request um, uh, process, um, you're, the user is only getting access to the necessary applications and the data associated with that application on a, on a per request basis. Um, and the other advantage by using the approach that we've taken is that one, it leverages uh, platforms that are potentially already uh, in use within your infrastructure today. Um, but it also, because it, it uses an access proxy approach, um, it hides the applications themselves from the 
especially in the remote user case, um, from the, the, the internet or being exposed um, to direct connections um, that are normally required to allow those ac the access to those applications from those, uh, from those pathways. So the model that we're going to, to, uh, to showcase not only has the ability to deal with applications that reside in the data center, but it also allows uh, for um, that controlled level of access to applications within private cloud, as well as public cloud. So the same client architecture, the same policy, and the same method for gaining access can be delivered across applications and data that reside in all of those areas. Um, and it also doesn't require um, that the user be only uh, remote, that we have the ability to both provide that, that similar um, per session um, kind of uh, monitoring and, and, and brokering of access in the, um, in the internal uh, network environment, as well as um, when, when using remote access as well. So we take that that same um, that same high level model, right? And you, you simplify it down to it doesn't really matter where the application is. Um, we're going to use this universal enforcement capability, um, regardless of where the user is as well. So this this distills down to um, leveraging the for the client environment, whether that user is sitting within a campus, within a branch or being a remote user. Um, so that's one component that's required for ZTNA to function. For the client central management capability or for the client EMS is kind of that, um, that repository of situational awareness, telemetry associated with the clients that are, um, that are connected to the management system and trying to gain access to the resources that are available across an agency's infrastructure. And then from a, a session brokering perspective, the FortiGate in its various form factors provide the access proxy function to allow that to occur. If we look at that a little bit more in detail, I'll go ahead and walk through the process itself. The Forti client platforms themselves, um, register with this central authority, the EMS platform. The EMS platform was originally designed to be a platform that provides central client management services and the delivery of that client configuration and, and profile down to each one of the individual uh, clients that are part of that uh, agency's infrastructure. In Forta, um, Forta Client 7.0, what we've done is we've created some telemetry gathering capability. So essentially, when that connection is made to the central management platform, telemetry is shared based on the attributes of the platform, as well as the, 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 the situational estate of the, uh, the system itself, the operating system, the applications that it's using. Um, and, and then also it gleans information about the user that is leveraging that platform uh, to try and access resources as well. Once that information is gained by the central management platform, it is then shared out to in, in a process called Fabric Sync to the various access proxy functions that exist within the agency's infrastructure. Uh, in this case, though, that access proxy is the FortiGate. Um, many agencies have that in a central location. Some agencies have that in a distributed uh, environment as well, especially if they've moved down the road of, of uh, incorporating our SD-WAN solution uh, within their environment as well. So um, the, the number of edges, the number of locations where that access proxy can exist could be one, could be many. It really depends on where the applications reside the level of efficiency you want to have between the client community and the, um, the, the resources um, that they're trying to gain access to. Um, and even for that matter, we have the ability to do to, to, to leverage a, 
um, a, a load balancing function that can, that can actually take um, reachability into account to determine what is the closest access proxy uh, to make that connection as well. So a lot of flexibility with regards to whether it's, but again, just trying to make it a, a simple assessment of, of what are the transactions that need to occur in order to broker this connection. So uh, we've got a, a client that registers with a, a central management system. It's giving real-time telemetry to the central management platform. That central management platform then synchronizes that information across its fabric to the various edges or access brokers, if you will, uh, across that environment. And then uh, with that information in play, right, at any point in time, a client at any location may want to um, may want to actually uh, access an application. Um, we're not we're not talking about the client trying to bring up a VPN. We're talking about the client bringing up their user interface for a client application. We're talking about them um, going to a web browser and pointing to that URL that represents their access to that web application. That's what we're talking about as the as the event that kicks off this next part of the process. So it's uh, it's a it's a behind the scenes establishment of a proxy connection to the appropriate edge for that particular application. So it's a tunnel check, it's a posture check, and and it's it's singularly focused on that particular application, the telemetry that was gathered originally by that client at that particular point in time, and whether or not the policy that's dictated both on the central management platform as well as the access proxy meets the criteria associated with that, um, with the tags that are that are delivered as part of that um, that that telemetry assessment of that particular system. In the event that everything matches, policy is uh, met, then that client can, uh, an, an actual, uh, and we'll see this in the demo itself, there is actually a, a secure session established between the client workstation and the access proxy itself. And that singular encrypted session then allows that, that single application session to exist between that enforcement edge and the application itself. This is all part of um, what is delivered is a combination between the software update that came about with the release of Forda OS 7.0. Forda OS 7.0 was released um, actually early last year. So, at this point in time, it's a very stable and mature operating system leveraged in a number of networks in the environment. Um, and the functionality that we're talking about for ZTNA, the, the, the base functionality, was delivered in the 7.0 version of Forda Client itself and its management platform. Uh, again, another thing that was brought about in early uh, 2021, um, and again, is, a, is, a, is in its maturity state uh, with regards to that. We, at the beginning of this year, actually released the 7.2 release of Forta OS and Forta Client as well. So the continual improvement of this solution uh, moves forward and the ability to leverage additional input uh, and provide a higher degree of API access to the platform is currently a work in progress. But again, the idea here is take a, a, an environment that you have today that leverages products that are in your network how can just a simple software upgrade and maybe the addition of another product actually move you forward on the zero trust journey? Um, the, um, the solution itself can also, sorry, um, uh, take advantage of um, uh, Forda Authenticator, Forda Token, potentially any other third party um, uh, authentication solution that's part of the security fabric. Um, I believe the demonstration itself will, will kind of be focused on our products, but again, we, we really hope to expand and showcase our, our levels of integration with other platforms as, as part of uh, you know, future demos as we move into the phase two of the, of the process. So the, the advantages, I think I, I've talked to a lot of those, the fact that you know, we're leveraging technology that's already there. 
if you've already made a, a an investment on um, a journey of, of SD WAN that that leverages Forta OS technology, this is a perfect add on. If you've already leveraged Forta client as a way to gain traditional VPN access, this is a way to augment VPN access uh, and then essentially pivot and transition completely to a per session based uh, on demand access with continual monitoring. Uh, to help improve that environment as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, you know, our team of, of remote resources leverage exactly the same client combination with its own edges um, to broker our own access to our, our internal applications. Um, and we do so in combination today where certain applications are based on VPN access, certain applications are based on ZTNA uh, access. So. It's a it's it's something that you can bring in. Uh, another thing that that uh, is kind of a, a tenant of you know how do we do these things efficiently is um, which applications are actually you know because because data is not data is obviously the thing that we want to protect, but not all data has the same levels of sensitivity. So do you want to put the same level of investment in all systems to support all types of data when potentially those sources of data don't necessarily have the same uh, compartmentalization requirements. So this is definitely a way to leverage current investment, uh, bring about zero trust principles and do so in a way that that can smoothly transition certain applications and users over to this method of, of access. Um, with that being said, what I want to do is kick off the demonstration so everybody can take a look at this. And then once that demonstration is over, we'll open it up uh, for questions for the final few minutes of the presentation and uh, go from there. Hello everyone. In this demo, we will go over 40Net ZTNA feature introduced with latest 40 OS 7.0 and 40 Client 7.0 software releases. The core component of 40Net ZTNA solution include 40 gates acting as the access proxy and 40 client as ZTNA agent. 40Net also offers IAM services utilizing 40 authenticator to manage identities and 40 token for multi-factor authentication. Before diving into the configuration portion, Let's look at the topology used for this demo. The remote users are connected to 40 gate on 10.101.16.x subnet configured on the WAN1 interface. Similarly, local users are connected via 172.31.20.x subnet configured on VLAN interface named local clients. And servers are sitting behind the DC server VLAN on 172.16.10.x subnet. Now, let's take a look at 40 client EMS on the dashboard, we can notice that EMS is running software version 7.0. There are total three endpoints connected, one on corporate network, while other two devices are remotely connected. Under the endpoint policies, I have configured on-net and off-net endpoint profiles for both IT and engineering departments. We can also define rules on the EMS to detect on-net or off-net endpoints. These rules can be based on a single or multiple available criteria. Moving forward, the Zero Trust tag offer dynamic access control by grouping endpoints based on the posture and various other criteria. We can combine multiple rules under tag definition in an AND fashion to go as granular as we want, in which case all the conditions should hold true for an endpoint to get assigned that specific tag. Under the Tag Monitor tab, we can see endpoint grouping by EMS based on the rules defined in the previous tab. As such, EMS plays the role of policy decision point in the Fortinet ZTNA solution. Another Zero Trust related config on EMS is the ZTNA CA certificate, which is used to issue unique certificates to each endpoint based on the 40 client UID. The 40 client agent utilizes these certificates to authenticate the endpoint devices with the 40 gate acting as the policy enforcement point. Now, let's look into ZTNA configuration aspects on 40 gate running 40 OS version 7.0. First, we need to enable the ZTNA and explicit proxy feature on the 40 gate by navigating to feature visibility under systems tab. 
Once we enable these features, ZTNA and authentication rule options will be available in the GUI under policy and object tab. ZTNA tags are the zero trust tags automatically synced from EMS to FortiGate in real time to control device and user access. The first thing we define under ZTNA tab are the ZTNA servers, also called access proxy VIPs, to which client connects over the HTTPS connection. Under the service and server mapping section, we can specify the virtual host, path, private IP address, and port number of the protected server that maps to the public internet facing virtual IP acting as the ZTNA gateway. Later, we define the ZTNA rules, also called proxy policies, to control access to the protected resources based on user authentication and tags assigned to each endpoint by EMS. Here, we can also apply security profiles to perform layer 7 content inspection. At this point, we have configured access proxy virtual IPs and proxy policies for granular access control. Now, we need to configure a firewall policy to redirect incoming user traffic to the virtual IPs. In the firewall policy, we need to enable full ZTNA functionality, specify all the interfaces where we expect user traffic, and select all configured virtual IPs for which we want to enable ZTNA. One last configuration part is setting up authentication rules and schemes which will be used by ZTNA rules to authenticate users. FortiGate supports multiple methods of authentication which includes FortiNet single sign-on, ADS single sign-on, LDAP, SAML and many more. Now let's get started with the demo. In the 4D client console, we can see that the device is not registered with the EMS. As such, it does not have the required tags to access the resources in the data center. Let's try to access engineering web server as is. Here, we can see that Codigate has blocked the connection request to the protected resource. Now, let's register the endpoint with EMS and wait for the configuration and telemetry sync. 4D client EMS assign tags to the managed endpoints based on its posture, location, and other parameters configured under zero trust tag rules. As we can see, the device has received an engineering tag and is remotely connected as per the device status. Let's try to access the same engineering web server again. We will connect to the virtual IP address configured for the engineering web server on FortiGate. Here, FortiGate will first authenticate the device utilizing the unique certificate issued to the endpoint by EMS server and later prompt the user for authentication. As we can see that the device and user authentication is successful and device has got the appropriate tag, so user is allowed to access the server. But in case user try to access a resource belonging to some other department, the access request will be denied since the device does not have the required tag. Similarly, moving on to the IT desktop, in the 4D client console, we can notice that it has IT infosec tag and status shows up as off fabric, which means the device is remote. Again, if we try to access a resource belonging to IT department, access will be granted based on the device and user authentication. But in case user try to access a resource belonging to different department, the access will be denied based on the tags and the rules configured under each of those tags. The last use case I want to cover is related to local devices on the corporate network. Again, in the 4D client console, we can see that the endpoint received an engineering tag and the status is on fabric, which means the device is local. The same firewall and proxy policies will be applied to this device as well, offering same security measure whether endpoint is on or off the network. We can run the same test as in previous steps to verify the functionality. Again, FortiGate will authenticate the device and user before granting the access. And any 
unauthorized access will be appropriately blocked. This concludes the demo. Thank you for watching. And with that, we're approaching a few minutes uh, before the end of the presentation. So I uh, would like to open it up for questions from the, from the audience and also provide link to email address uh, that you can reach out for more information. If there's no uh, if there's no questions from the field, uh, I'll just provide some additional context with regards to this as we wrap up the last couple of minutes. Uh, so again, thanks for the opportunity uh, to to present uh, kind of the uh, the framework of our solutions with regards to uh, zero trust and zero trust network access specifically. Um, looks like we might have something in the ah so huddle space info. Okay, so we will be providing just as far as what we're providing, the huddle space is made available to members of the Zero Trust uh, working group through ATARC itself. Those that have access to the huddle space um, itself uh, will be able to access resources from each one of the vendors presentations. I think there'll be a follow on link shared as well as a kind of a, a typical uh, typical process for how all of these sessions are handled. Um, they'll show a link to uh, the replay of the of the presentation itself, uh, but the huddle site is where we will be placing our vendor presentation, a copy of that vendor presentation itself, as well as the details associated with that zero trust capabilities mapping as well. Um, if you have uh, an interest and you're outside of that particular group or, or don't have access to the huddle site itself, please feel free to send an email to uh, federal at fortinet.com um, and we'll definitely follow up with you directly and get you um, uh, access to those resources as well. Just uh, just for a point of clarity, I just wanted to, you know, this was a, a relatively generic um, uh, demonstration itself of the client operation, um, you know, only showing one tag and, and only showing, um, you know, kind of uh, two assets that, that, uh, uh, that were examples for uh, the function itself. You know, obviously the policy itself has the ability to, to leverage multiple tags. Uh, those tags can range a, a whole host of, of various uh, options with regards to, to what type of attributes that the, the telemetry collects on a regular basis. Um, and as far as integration with other uh, services and capabilities that exist within the infrastructure, this is, this is literally just an, an access method change. Um, as far as the other uh, 800-53 controls that are that are required between various resources, you know th those are still going to be the responsibility of, of, of or capability of both the FortiGate as well as other security appliances that reside between the connection between um, that access proxy and the application itself. Um, so uh, all of those other security. Um, you know, controls and, and levels of visibility are still there. Uh, the data can still be uh, interrogated um, uh, to uh, to assess whether or not malware exists within uh, the particular stream itself. So, so it's 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 meant to be a complementary component to the entire solution, not a not an overarching complete replacement for how uh, network infrastructure should be uh, deployed uh, in an agency environment. So, um, uh, again, hope hopefully positioned as uh, a component of that overall architecture and one that can be very complementary to uh, all of the modernizations that agencies have gone through uh, up to this point, including incorporation with um, you know, traditional WAN technologies as well as um, uh, SD-WAN technologies as well. Any other questions? Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll say thanks again and um, 
Chris or any of the other uh, ATARC representatives, if you want to close the meeting, we're good to go.